Describe that presentation. How would you go in and present this idea? We went down, we talked about the feasibility study, we talked about the research background, we talked about the need, we talked about the proposal, and uh, we were true believers. So when, you're, when you believe in something, it makes it easier to, to uh, be convincing. But it was a negative, negative group, definitely a negative group. Well, at the end of that time, Doc looked up and said, the eyes have it. And he just said, we're going to do this. So all the negative votes in the room didn't outweigh the one vote that in this room counted. And he then appointed Lou Hausman. Lou Hausman had been, I believe, at either NBC or CBS before he went to the Office of Education as special assistant to Doc Howe. So Lou came out of commercial television, and he was the um, liaison person between the office and ourselves. And he worked with us, and the first thing he did, he said, your budget is too small. He said, you've got four million, it's gonna take at least eight. So we re revised our budget to eight million. And then Doc says, we'll put up half. <coughs> Now we've got five million, Carnegie's one, Office of Education four. It wasn't all from the Office of Education because some other governmental agencies came in through the Office of Education, but primarily Office of Education money. And Doc also called up his friend Champ Ward at the Ford Foundation and said, you made a mistake. Ford reversed itself and came in also. And the amount that they came in for, I'm going to say, was either a million or a million five. So now we're up to six and a half. The rest was relatively easy. It came in smaller amounts. Uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting gave us some money. And we had eight million dollars at the end of that time. What was that going to buy at eight million dollars? It was going to buy one season program. Still no airtime. Back I go to NBC and Group W. Now it's a different story. Fully funded, no airtime. You know why? Sure, and, and you, you know why too. <laughs> that is, there's no advertising on the program. What are the advertisers gonna do? We, we depend on, I mean, they didn't say this, but we depend on advertising support for, for the income that we use, and you're gonna use airtime that we could otherwise sell. That, that was the basic reason. Did, did any of them ask for advertising airtime or say, can you do this with a sponsor? Not really. The other thing was, of course, children's programming does not draw the audiences that you want to draw for primetime television or any time television because children, three to five year old children are not big consumers. All those things were in the background. No airtime. Uh, Lou, was Lou was convinced that the program should be on commercial broadcasting. So that's why, why I, this part of the story I've just told is relevant. He thought in order to reach the num maximum number of people, you have to be on commercial broadcasting. Public broadcasting, this is right now we're in 1968, was, there wasn't any public broadcasting, it was educational television at that time because Public Broadcasting Act was passed in 69. So we failed and to get it on commercial television, and then we were left with uh, educational television, or what we now call public television, as the alternative. They were starving for, for programming, and therefore it was relatively easy to get it on the air there, except that there was no means of, uh, of uh, easy transmission of the program. It had to be bicycled around, tapes, the tapes had to be bicycled to individual stations. So that was the way it went on the air at first in 1969, November 1969. Then the Public Broadcasting Act had been passed and so there was a public broadcasting system rather than a conglomeration of educational television stations. That made it a little easier but that, that was the way it first got on the air.